today we're going to start learning about Ruby on Rails. So this is kind of like here it is. Here it is. This is this is it. We've been waiting for so long for this, um, and we're going to build things the old-fashioned way, like the correct, honestly, the correct way to do things when we build stuff in Rails, and then later down the line, like a week from now or so, we'll teach you shortcuts to make this development process faster. Um, so yeah, we'll just kind of show that off. So we, today we're talking about Ruby on Rails and uh, Ruby on Rails, GitHub. Ruby on Rails is an open source library platform. Like it's it's a it's a it's a web it's like a web web app framework. And a framework is basically again thousands of lines of code that somebody wrote. If not, it's probably more than thousands of lines of code. Tens of thousands of lines, hundreds of thousands of lines of code that people have written ahead of time to make your life developing stuff easier. Now, when you think about things, now Ruby on Rails has its place in many different companies. Groupon.com was originally written on Ruby on Rails. I don't know what it is anymore, but I know that the main monolith that powers it, like uh, the main meat of the organization is still written in Ruby on Rails. Raise.com is raised, how much did Raise? Raise uh, funding. Uh, Raise.com. I, I cannot believe this is a thing. How did you, how did you, sixty million dollars from PayPal uh, during a Series C in last month? So like they are doing crazy things, and it's it's really wonderful to see like a Chicago company doing so well. But it's also written on it, it not but it is written on Ruby on Rails. Twitter at the beginning was written on Ruby on Rails. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. In, in Chicago? No, in San oh. Francisco. <laughs> uh, so like Rails definitely has its its perks. The main perk being that I can get a pretty well functioning web application off the ground really fast. Like I can get something from zero to pretty decent in like three months, if not less than that, less time than that, depending on how many hours you work. Uh, the bad part about it is that Rails is very slow. Um, so it's, if you need to get like a prototype to get Series A funding or to prove to your investors or something like that, like a proof of concept and show something that really works right away, Rails is your go-to place and that, that's a, something that you want. However, it's really slow. Active Record can only handle several hundred hits per minute, uh, per second. So it's like if I have, let's say I have Twitter.com and I had 200 people hitting my database every single second, Active Record can handle that. That's something it can do. But once you get to Twitter scale now where it's like 10,000, 100,000, like way more than 200 hits per second, uh, then, you, then you have an issue with like performance because like Rails is just not fast enough to keep up with that. So there are better tools out there. Java is one of those better tools. That's why Java has been around for a super long time. JavaScript is another like faster language. Um, so they both have their pluses and minuses. Um, Rails, as you can see, all the source code is here. It's open source, meaning that anyone can see what goes on underneath the hood. They can see who the big contributors are. The big ones are going to be DHH is going to come first, and then Tender Love is going to come second, and then these top. It's just a, I think it's just a hilarious <laughs> photograph. It's like the old romance novels from the, from the 80s. Um, yeah. So these top 10 people here most likely are core, core contributors to Rails. It's like people that may not all work for the same company, but they are paid by companies to maintain the software. Um, it's a great, it's a great asset for for Git, I think he works for GitHub, yeah. Aaron works for GitHub, for GitHub to say, like, oh, we employ the number two contributor to Rails, so we're gonna pay that person. Um, there is a company called Heroku, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about in about three or four weeks, uh, actually two weeks, um, which basically does, like, you can deploy your application from your computer into the web and everyone can visit it. Uh, they, they hire the person who wrote Ruby like the person who actually wrote the Ruby language, uh, it's a Japanese gentleman named Mats, and uh, he works down the hall from some of the developers. I was like, what's, what is that like? So there are, there are many, many companies that just kind of like hire these developers as open source contributors, as like super senior engineers. Um, so Rails came first, and then uh, Sinatra came second. Rails came first because basically DHH was the main contributor of Rails 
um, started when, when this person was writing web applications here in Chicago for a consultancy called Basecamp, uh, which was originally called 37 Signals, he realized I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. Everybody wants the ability to CRUD stuff really fast. Everyone wants like a login functionality. Why don't I just make that into like a framework of, of my own that I can just like spin up really fast. I can, I can save myself so much development time and get so much more money for, for, uh, for my clients or, and, and for my company. Um, so Rails is called a, like, a very opinionated framework. They think there's a right way of doing things. Like 100%, like we, like we as an organization, like as a group of 10 main contributors or something like that, we think that this is the best way to develop software. This is the way you should name all your routes. This is the way you should name all your controllers. This is the way you should name your tables and things of that nature. Uh, so they make a lot of that, um, they make a lot of those judgments for you. And as a result, you have something called convention over configuration, which I've heard at least one person just throw out there for, for like, just as like a, oh, it was Peter. It was Peter. He just kind of like threw that out as like a, a as like a buzzword, like a like a nice phrase. Convention of con configuration means that um, there's a convention of ways that software is usually written. There's a way that it's that the the writers of Rails have more or less said like, this is the right way of writing software and it's just going to work. Like it's just magically going to work so that you don't have to set up as much stuff. Like you won't have to do all like the require relative on every single page because they said it's convention over configuration. You're gonna require almost every file everywhere. So we're just gonna configure that for you so that you don't have to do it yourself. Like whereas like before we were running shotgun to one specific file um, they're saying you're probably going to want a shotgun like every single thing. So we won't we won't use shotgun anymore. We're going to use something called Puma, and we're going to load up that server for you that loads in everything and automatically refreshes. So I don't have to do that convention convention over configuration. So those are some of the small things uh, that they give to you for free. Um, and you're going to see today when we deal with routes specifically, um, there's a brand new way of dealing with routes that they say like, why write all your routes inside of all your controllers? Why don't you just have it one place? Convention over configuration. Like it's, it's probably a better convention to throw it all in one file rather than to configure everything yourself. So, um, and another thing, like active record objects always have an ID column because it's a SQL database. All SQL databases should have ID columns for primary keys. So they're kind of like, you never need to type that in ever again. We'll take care of it underneath the hood. Another example of configure, a convention over configuration. All right, so with that, no, I don't want this over here. We're going to create our very first new Rails project. So everyone's gonna start off by doing gem install. Is this too small or is this fine? Okay. Gem install Rails. This could take a little bit of time. For me, it's, uh, I've already installed it, so here it is. So we're on uh, Rails 514, go ahead. And, and so certain, just, just again, from the source procedure level, so there's certain people that just code, like, does everybody who uses Ruby use Rails? No. Okay. That's, a, that's a great question. So it's like, like I was saying, Sinatra was built as a counterpart to Rails, so Rails came first. And it's, it's very heavy. There's a lot of stuff that's being installed. And for some people, they're like, I don't need all of this extra crap. I just want, like, a very simple framework uh, that does exactly what I tell it to do. And then you have... Um, that's where Sinatra came into play, where you get to choose what gems generally come in. You get to set up all of your R spec. You get to set up all of your okay. controllers and things like that. And there's another one. There's other like less popular ones. I think there's one called Volt that has not really caught on. This was like a really big thing for like a period of like three months. Um, but you can kind of see when I compare GitHub.com. Yeah, you can kind of see like the difference in popularity. There's 15,000 forks. There's 213 forks. There's 60 contributors and 3,000 contributors. There's 2,000 commits versus 65,000. Um, and the last time this was updated was two years ago. So it's like this is a, another way of writing applications. There's other Ruby frameworks to write web applications. It's just none of them have caught on quite as much as Rails. And Rails will be, uh, quite honestly, around for most likely the remainder of our of our professional careers. 
because there was such a boom in the early to early to mid 2000s companies, companies have written, written their stuff in it and you need to maintain it yeah. and new companies are coming up and they're like we we still need something fast to get to market so there's enough companies that have like comcast is hiring for ruby on rails developers so well i think ruby will be around safely for for a long time what are what are other options besides ruby on rails to get that quick you know besides the ruby language like is go and like all the swift or like all these other things that are, is there anything else that also has that really easy framework that you can create a create an app and um i mean there's ruby? Not, not, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily Ruby. So what's a framework to get an idea from like Django. In Django, yeah. Django is uh, the Python. Oh, no. Python. Python? Yeah, Django and Django is Python's big framework. Okay. And then Rails is Ruby's big framework. Yeah. Uh, Meteor is, uh, is that? Yeah. Okay, so there's, yes. So there, there are many different options. Yeah. yeah, it just depends on your level of expertise and things like that. Yeah. All right. So let's jump back over here, gem install Rails. And then we're just gonna start a new project by running Rails new, and we'll call today's uh, challenge called businesses. We're just gonna create, we're just gonna have a single resource called a business where we can crud a business. We can you know, create new businesses, edit, delete, destroy, read, everything like that. I'm gonna post, do a bunch of other stuff. So this is the general thing I'm gonna start typing to get everything set up. So it's Rails new businesses, and I'm saying the database type is gonna be Postgres instead of SQLite, which is what it ships automatically with. I'm turning off the testing uh, framework with this dash T here, and then I'm shutting off Turbo Links. Now, this seems kind of contradictory to say like, oh, if they know what's best and they've made that decision for you, why are we automatically just rewriting half the things that it comes with? Um, and basically what's happened is the people who wrote Rails, like this is what worked for them, but the community as a whole has decided that this is not like the, the, the best, the absolute best way. So we're gonna create aftermarket libraries, things like RSpec um, that are that very, very verbose and, and do quite well. I think they're kind of bringing that into Rails like slowly, but it's shipping by default with something called like test unit, which is not nearly as uh, common in the professional workplace. Um, most people don't use SQLite as a database. Like it's good for toy apps, but Postgres is something that you can ship and deploy to production, get hundreds of thousands of users using. And then TurboLinks, uh, we'll get into a little bit more later. So this, we're gonna be dealing with what's called the Rails Prime stack rather than the Rails stack. So I'm gonna t install this, this can take a little bit. All right. And if we list out everything, we, we're gonna, we see that businesses now exists right here. So I'm gonna CD into business, businesses, open everything up in Sublime, split myself into three different windows. And we see way more stuff than before. I'm just gonna open all of the, actually, I, I don't think I can, it's just too much stuff. So much extra garbage. In, in businesses was just something you, that was just a name. That was just the name of the of the uh, of the project. The, yeah. It's like I mean, Groupon two point or something. Rails that's coming up here. What's that? This is all rails. This is all rails that's coming up here. So we've been dealing with. We started in week one with one file. We, then we moved into Apple Trees where we had six files. Then we got into like Sinatra. Uh, and then we got into like Active Record where we had like ten. And then Sinatra we got to like twelve or something like that. Uh, when we run all of this, there are 36 directories and 56 files that Rails gives us for free. So I'm going to close all of these and just kind of go over a basic idea of each one. So under app is where most of your stuff is going to live. So under app assets, sorry, app assets, this is where like, like the one place to hold all of your CSS, your JavaScript, all of your images, all of that stuff goes inside of here. So if you have a special, if you're bringing in jQuery and you want it loaded in locally here, or if you have bootstrap CSS, you're gonna put that under style sheets. All of that stuff is gonna go right here under app assets. This channels thing is a, new, um, is a new thing that's built into Rails. 
have you been to the websites where it's like I visit the website and there's a chat functionality right on the home page yeah, yeah, yeah. and I can talk in real time with somebody? Yeah. Um, it's a very advanced piece of technology that prior to Rails 5, like we had to set up so much extra stuff. Yeah. And the idea is because it's instant communication, that means I have to open a line of communication directly from Taylor's computer into my computer. Like it has to be open so that we can see each other type at, this, at any given time. It's kind of like when you text somebody now and you see the little three dots if you have iMessage or something like that, or you see blah, blah, blah is typing. There's an open connection so that it's like we're no longer doing a request and response. There's a complete tunnel between me and uh, Taylor. Uh, so that's, this, that's what channel has here. Uh, there's, it's pretty easy to set up a chat application. You, I've seen one Bravo grad set it up in 15 minutes because there's just really great tutorials. But this is where that stuff would go. The implementation for Rails is called application cable, which inherits from action cable channel base. And then uh, there's a few configuration things that you need to set up, but you can set up a chat functionality inside your Rails application. Can you get that? So like, let's say, let's say you have a small company and you have like a dedicated HR like person. Right? Yeah. So you're trying to get this up. People visit the website, go to this chat function. Can you have that chat on somebody else's computer connect to like a cell phone to where it's like, I don't doubt that. No, I, I, I don't know how to set it up. Yeah. Um, but I would assume it's not terribly difficult. Yeah. Because that is what people end up doing. Yeah. Because it's you like about instant notification that mm -hmm. somebody's. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Cool. Controllers, we know controllers. We've dealt with those. That's the same thing. Uh, controllers are just like where all of your, all your uh, logic goes. And we'll get back to this in just a little bit. Uh, helpers basically is, is all the things that we need in order to help render the views. So it's kind of like if I were to, if I was logged in, right, I'm going to have a, a, like a helper method just to basically say like, if this person is logged in, this is what the view is going to look like. It's going to say, hello, Jonathan, at the top of your amazon.com page rather than hello, sign in. You know, so that's, that's where this goes. Jobs is basically for um, lets us do work asynchronously. So if you need to send a confirmation email in the background, you're not shutting down your entire application and waiting for that to happen. It just says, do this later. Whenever you have ch a chance, just run it in the background. Mailers allow you to send email, uh, which is kind of fancy. And anyone can learn it. There's a bunch of tutorials online. Um, I had to implement this for my second job when I had no semblance of an understanding of how to do it. Um, Models we know, views we know. So there's a few extra things here that are very rich in case you ever want to do something with uh, chat functionality or email or running stuff in the background. Uh, Bin holds all the stuff that Rails gives us like rake. And uh, basically now we're no longer gonna use rake db drop, it's gonna be Rails db drop. Uh, but you can still use rake, it's backwards compatible. But the new one is gonna be Rails. Bundle, like if you've ever wondered, like what does Bundle actually do? It's all of this code inside of here, um, so on and so forth. Config holds all the configuration for the application. The big things that you need to know are um, like environments. So there's specific things that Rails gives you by default for your product, for your development, production, and test. So remember when we were dealing with Sinatra, we had to say like rake db drop app n equals test, right? Like, so I'm just dropping the test development data, uh, test environment database, or I'm just creating the development database. Um, Rails takes care of all of that for you. So if I'm running stuff in test, I don't need to specify test. I'm only gonna be using the database for test. Like it's something that they know by default. Uh, initializers configures all the libraries that we have. You don't need to know this for right now. Uh, Locales is basically just a bunch of translation uh, libraries that we have. So we're just saying like we're using English. Uh, all of these you pretty much don't really need to know. Uh, DB is all the stuff that we already know. There's going to be a migrate file with migrations. There's going to be a seeds file with seeds in here. Lib is for all library code that isn't real specific. Logs are for all the logs that happen inside of your application. Uh, and so this is it's going to automatically push and explore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you don't have to like say like write this to the log and save it in this file. Like it'll automatically keep it in here for you. And that's just sort of like the transaction or the communication transaction between. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like if something blew up at 1242 PM central yeah. time, 
okay, let's take a look at the logs and see what happened. What was the request that was sent over? What was the response that came back? It was automatically like separate logs out day by day yep. or by. Yep. So this is that net balance thing is just huge. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, it's just also a giant data dump, so you have to like look straight through it. Yeah. And you yeah. can imagine if you're Amazon, you have millions of hits a second. Yeah. You know, it's going to be completely unfindable. Yeah. There's actually an entire other business about like how to read your logs effectively. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get too much more into the other ones, um, but like all of this is written inside of your uh, your curriculum, so you don't need to worry too much about that. So uh, I'm going to first. Uh, where is where did we go? Okay, I'm going to first set up uh, our spec just so we have some testing framework set up, and we all we have to do to run that is bundle exec Rails generate our spec install, and it'll tell you what I'm what what's doing here. Bundle um, exec. Oh, I need to add the our spec gem. Hold on. I know I'm going to need a faker in here eventually. So faker, and then I'm going to do gem rspec rails. Bundle install to install all the gems. Run this rspec install again. And it creates a few things for me. It creates a spec folder, a spec helper, and a rails helper. So this is like, now we're going to be able to write tests using rspec just like we're used to. John, John can, you, can you say again what the helper file is besides just like the spec rb? Sorry? So like the, it says helper, what is that? What's the difference between just the helper file and then the R spec? So we haven't really gotten into like what the helper does quite yet. Okay. Um, so let's take a look. Rails helper. Yeah, I, I don't want to derail here. You know, sure. Uh, there's a lot of like free stuff that like Rails kind of gives for, uh, R spec gives to you that you need in order to like set up your specs effectively. So it's all thrown inside of Rails helper here. Um, spec helper is largely similar, but it's kind of like if I am going to test like the like the login functionality over and over again, I'm not going to put it inside of my tests in every, in every single block of code. I'm going to put that inside the spec helper or the Rails helper, and then just call it once. It's kind of like yesterday. Remember, we created like 50 dogs. Like every single test created like a new dog. I might not want to do that. I might just say like. I'll put it inside of the spec helper called like def create dog. And then like, it was like animal.create or something like that. And then inside my spec, I will just call create dog rather than repeating the same code, piece of code 50 times. Okay. All right. So we have our R spec installed now, and now we're going to move over to starting to generate migrations for businesses. So I'm going to do rail, bundle, bundle exec Rails G migration create businesses. Now, Rails gives you a lot of these uh, generators. The alias for it is G. You can, tell, you can write generate or G, um, and they will both work. And basically what it's doing is it's creating a DB migrate folder with this crazy looking timestamp with a file called create businesses. So this is the migration that we're used to. Maybe we'll just say a business has a name, an address, and a description. Address, oops, string, address, t.string for description. And then it has t.timestamps. So I'm just creating a simple table. This is very similar to Sinatra so far, right? Not much has changed. And then I'm going to, since I know that I have a table in the database called businesses, I'm going to need to create a, like a model here. So I'm going to run bundle exec rails g model business. Remember, one is singular and one is uh, plural. And I run this, but there's a conflict. It turns out that this generate model will actually generate the migration and the model file for you and the controller. So let's uh, go back. Here. What's that? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like automatic things. <laughs> so I'm gonna get rid of this whole whole folder for right now. I'm just gonna run 
bundle exec rails g model business and we'll see all the free stuff that we get we get the business migration we get the 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 model itself and the corresponding spec for it so i don't have to create three new files this one command will do it all for me i mean you still have to write the code but what <laughs> and it knows by default that i'm going to have times all right, and maybe we'll create some validations in here as well. So I have this business. Maybe I will say validates uh, name, presence true, and then validates address, presence true. Um, so all I've done so far is I ran one command. I have my migration, which I said a business has a name, address, and description, no associations, just one table today. And we have the business model, so it's singular. Uh, and it's just, I make whenever I save it, I have to make sure that the name and address are both present before I can save it into the database. All right, let's uh, create some seats. So this is all, um, this is all boilerplate. I'm just going to create 10 businesses. This business is gonna have a company name, uh, address, and a city, and then a, um, a description. Um, this faker company dot BS literally stands for BS. Uh, so it's like stuff that your company will do. It's kind of fun. So with that, we will run bundle exec. Uh, let me just run bundle install, just in case. So bundle exec. Rails DB drop. Create. Migrate. I'm surprised you don't have Let's see. Like a shortcut for all that stuff. I do. Um, oh. I do. If you take a look inside my bash profile, I have something called YOLO. So not only have I, I have alias bundle exec down to be i've aliased drop to bundle exec rake db drop i've done all of this and then i've aliased my alias to yolo to drop and create and migrate and seed all all at the same time so if you know that you're going to be doing that over and over again you can create an alias it's fine um yeah it's fine I'm gonna get rid of it. Put it here. so it looks like nothing broke so we're good to go on. One of the biggest differences between Rails and Sinatra that you all are gonna have to more or less just kind of get used to is the difference in routing. So before we threw everything in the controllers, but that doesn't make a ton of sense because it's kind of like, I have if I have more than one controller, then I'll have many different routes and it's not all in one place. So Rails, the team, team behind them says like, I, I want to figure out where my, um, I want one place to have all of my routes. And that's under config routes. And the way that I'm gonna set up a, um, the way that I'm gonna set this up is I'm gonna have a couple of things. I'll put this up here. Um, let me just start the server. So bundle exec rails server or rails s. Um, I actually aliased it to S, just the letter S. Okay. Is yeah. Does Rake console still work? Uh, it's going to be Rails console. Yes. But yes, it does. You want to run that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Business dot all. So I have all of these different businesses. Let's just choose one. All right. So the business name is Jacoby Gottlieb in uh, this address. And the description is, remember I did company, faker company dot BS, engineer magnetic e-commerce. <laughs> I will choose the last one. I have a uh, Keen, Lushk, and Bode at this at this particular place. I don't know, utilize synergistic ROI. So it's just kind of like the, it's like typical company BS, right? Like I, I like it a lot. Uh, anything else you wanted to do with this, or did you just wanted to see it? Okay. Sounds like a merger. 
So I'm going to do bundle exec Rails server, similar to bundle exec shotgun, but Rails server um, is a little bit more robust. There's some, there's another piece of technology powering it compared to the shotgun. The port number is going to change. It's going to be 3000 and that's uh, what most Rails apps are going to start off at. The, the default port is just 3000. There's no real difference. I can specify a different port if I want to by just saying uh, bundle exec Rails server dash P of like, 45, 6, 7, or something like that. And then it'll just load up on 4, 5, 6, 7. So, but by default, it's going to go to 3,000. So, localhost 3,000, and everything's going to blow up. It says there's an uninitialized business controller. Okay, cool. So, let's take a look at this routes that we have. So line two, I have this little bit here that says root to business index. Uh, we've never seen this before, but if we break it down, it says root to, meaning like by default, the home page is going to point me to the businesses controller index action. When I go, and then whenever anybody makes a request to slash businesses, I'm just gonna redirect them to the home page, which tells, takes me to the businesses controller index, um, index action. Before when we were writing things inside of like, the, before when we were writing things as we would have like, let's say this was businesses controller dot RB, it was like get slash or something like that, do, and then ERB businesses slash index. That this is what, this is what we used to do in Sinatra, right? Now it's just saying, I'm, I don't care what's I, like, it's not inside of a controller anymore. It's in this file called routes, so I'm just saying, Take me to the businesses controller and the index um, action specifically. When we load up the page, it says there's an uninitialized constant businesses controller. All right. So if I take a look under app controllers, I see that there's no business controller. So I have to put that in there. I'll do businesses controller dot RB. Save and refresh. Yes. Cool. I expected it's a different error now, right? It's more a little bit more descriptive. It says I expected there to be a business controller in this file, but there was nothing inside of there, so I blew up. So, like we talked about yesterday, I really want to um Kind of talk about MVC real quick one more time. Use this one. All right, so MVC is a stands for Model View Controller. It's a software architectural pattern for organizing your code. So model we know as just like if we have like a businesses table, the model is going to be called business, like a singular version of the table name. And that's the thing, that's the layer. The model is the layer that connects from your Ruby application down into your database. So when I do like business.new or business.save or business.update or something like that, um, I'm talking directly into the database and doing stuff with it. The view is self-explanatory. It's just what you see on the screen. And then the controller is like the brains of the operation. So anytime you make a web request, like when I make a request to, when I make a request to uh, slash businesses, it'll redirect me to the home page, and that takes me to line two, and it says like, okay, I'm going to send you over over to businesses controller uh, in the index, and then that will take care of all the heavy lifting uh, for you. So we have this businesses controller and we will get the code to get it going. So I have business controller inherits from application controller, which inherits from action controller base. Uh, you don't really need to worry too much about this file. All you need to know is just businesses controller will always inherit from the thing that's already there, uh, which is application controller. I created an empty index and let's refresh the page and see what we get. Cool, we get something different this time. It says that business controller index is missing a template for this request. Template meaning the view. It doesn't have a view quite yet. 
So I'm going to go down to views, create a new folder for businesses. And the reason I'm having specific, um, the reason why I'm having specific folders is that right now we're only dealing with one resource, just businesses. But let's say we want to create Yelp. A business has many reviews, right? So when I say like, I want the index page and it, I just throw it underneath views, it's like, are you talking about the reviews index page or are you talking about the indexes, uh, the businesses index page? That's why we want to do it like that. I'm going to create a new file called index.html.erb. So it's slightly different. You have to add that .html, which kind of sucks. Um, but it is what it is. And let's see, I'm going to split the screen in two. Where's the thing? looks very similar to your Sinatra, does it not? So again, I'm making a request to the home page. That like that's this root too. So it's like whenever anyone makes a, a request to just slash, um, it's gonna take me to the businesses controller and the index action. So I go over to businesses controller index action. It does a bunch of stuff for me, which basically means like this is the model layer. So I'm saying business, connect to the database and get me all the businesses that are inside the database and save it to the instance variable of at business. Now, if we were to do this in Sinatra, it'd look a little something like this, where it's like a uh, business equals business dot all. And then it'd be like ERB index and locals, businesses, businesses, something like that, right? This is what it looks like in Sinatra. This is the dumbed down version inside of Rails. So, the important thing to know is that I can set an instance variable here in the index and I can pass it down one level to the, to the view. I don't have to say, I don't have to specify index as a like ERB template because it's by default going to look for the corresponding. So if I have an index action, it's looking for an index view. So as long as these two things are named the same thing, uh, it will automatically know to do that. Inside business inside businesses, correct. And then I don't need to pass in locals anymore because as long as I set an instance variable in the controller, I can pass it down one level here to the view. Um, just to verify that this works, we'll refresh the page. And there we go, we have all the businesses listed from the listed from the database. Is Sinatra faster than Rails? Or Sinatra is faster than Rails. But it's not, okay, so what's the, it's, it's not as robust you have to like it's a it's a skeleton that you have to put together yourself yeah it's kind of like um, it's kind of like a, like a stock car versus like a like a race car or something like that. what is a stock car actually it's kind of like having a bare bones car that just takes you from point A to point B and you can add stuff and modify it yourself or you can just go on the Nissan line and buy a GTR uh, Skyline or something like that is it fast enough what's that is it fast enough to handle more complex websites, Sinatra, or is it still? Not that I've seen. I haven't seen a lot of companies use Sinatra, that's all. Wait, I, like, sorry, say again. I haven't seen a lot of companies use Sinatra professionally. But not to mean that it couldn't. Not be. to mean that it couldn't, right? Yeah. Trunk Club was written in Sinatra. So Trunk Club is a like a clothing website bought by Nordstrom for like 500 million. Um, wow. Yeah. And there was their their platform was written in Sinatra because they they didn't think they needed anything heavy duty. Since then they moved onto Rails and like Go and other big languages like that. But they started off like that. And then Chris Walquist, as you know from DRW, has internal projects just for you know different teams that are written in Sinatra because you don't need Rails. It's like it's but if you're getting to like if you want the functionality of emails and nice things like that, uh, you probably need Rails. Like Sinatra. Like you can configure it yourself. It would might take a long time or Rails you can do it in 15 minutes. Okay. Emails is in like... I can send an email from my application. Okay. Can you give me like a concrete example then? Like you all... You sign up for a... Um, you sign up for 
uh, a website yep. and they say check your email yep. for a confirmation link. Okay. Rails yep. can send that for you. Immediately in send it. It's got the text. It's got the person's yeah. name. Yeah. So you could like it has. I mean, it doesn't have all of that. You it's not. It, it, you still have to program that in. Yeah, but, but it, it has the ability to, to do that. that. Yeah. Uh, Sinatra, I'm not sure if it has the functionality to do okay. that. I don't have enough professional experience to, with Sinatra to tell you one way or the other. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's a client side in the, like the server side, or like, like what do you have access to that, you know, how are you seeing, like, how are you composing these emails that you're distributing for? It's, uh, it's all done on the server side. But it all says the same thing, right? Hello, Alex. Like to confirm your thing, please click this link within the next twenty-four hours. It's an HTML. Form. It's just it's it's honestly just another view uh, here. So you select like your, whoever you want to send it to. Whatever. Yeah, something like that would be like def send email or something like that, where it's like at person equals person dot find by email address or something, mm -hmm. and then you pass in the email address, and then that person has a first name that you can say, hello, first name, mm -hmm. like, please respond by date, you know? So, auto emails, but it wouldn't be like a mailer, like a, like a monthly mailer. You could send a monthly mailer. Mm -hmm. You can set up Rails to do that. Yeah. Again, it's like a, it's a scale thing. It's mm -hmm. if you have hundreds of thousands of customers, you might not want to use Rails for mm -hmm. that particular piece. But if you have 2,000 people on it, sure, go ahead, you can run it. So why, I mean, this, all this functionality looks great. Why, why hasn't, um, I mean, do people just like out east or out west just prefer using, uh, what do we call them, Python or the other ones? Yeah, like, why, why, isn't, why isn't Ruby caught on? Ruby has caught on. I mean, it's, I mean, there's Fortune 500 companies that are written with at least something, some things in Ruby. Just their, their main platform may not be, like Ruby's just too slow for like a, a scale of Twitter or something like that. Uh, Amazon okay. is just yeah. too large yeah. for Twitter, for Ruby to handle. Okay. But it's like, it's perfect for that mid market. Like, yeah. oh, I only have 10,000 or 15,000 people using my stuff. Yeah. I might be a small it, So that's where, that's where you, you put the cap at though? Yeah, I, I would say it's kind of like once your site starts like suffering in terms of performance, you might want to look at something else. Yeah. But that's a good problem to have, right? Yeah. Like most people hope to get to that point where it's like, I have too many people using my site. It's yeah. slowing down. I need better technology. You know, that's a that's a phenomenal problem to have. But most people, right off the beginning, they're not thinking about that. Yeah. You know, there's some business just down the hall. Like, I only see three people in there. Like, are they using Rails? Maybe. Yeah. But it's like I just need to make my paycheck in six months. You know, yeah. I, I need to have a job in six months. So I need to get this off the ground. So yeah. a lot of people aren't thinking about it that way. All right. So we're going to do CRUD today. Um, right now we're able to see everything. So let's get to the point where we can read. Um, right now we can read all of them. But let's create maybe some links in here. And then we can, uh, maybe we can create some links in here and then visit each individual one. All right, so we'll add this to our routes file. Get slash businesses ID to businesses show. So whenever anyone makes a get request to businesses slash one, two, three, four, five, it'll take me to the businesses um, controller and the show method. So first half of the hashtag is the controller name, second half of the hashtag is the method name. I'm gonna do at def, uh, def show, and I'll do at business equals business dot find params ID. Same thing as same thing as Sinatra, completely identical. Um, with that, we need a show, um, we're gonna need a show ERB file. So I'm gonna create a new one down here called show.html.erb. Again, the, the minor difference between Sinatra and Rails is that Rails, you need that .html.erb. Sinatra did not need that. And I'm just going to put this Piece of code in there. So all I'm doing is I have an H1, I'm interpolating the business's name, it's gonna list out the description and address, and then just have a little button to go back. So if this works well, I can go to slash businesses slash three. Boo. 
Um, oh, I'm missing a comma. So we have businesses slash three, Ocon, Purdy, and Bartoletti, and all this kind of stuff. If I press back, it'll take me here. All right, so if I, at this point, I can see an individual business, I can see all the businesses, I want to make all of these links now. So where do I go to make all of these links? So I'm thinking, I look at this page, I was like, okay, this is the home page. I need to find the view that's there so I can make all of these particular things links. So I'm gonna go to here, I was like, okay, home page will take me to businesses, controller index. All right, here's the index here. It's that, that's the name of the um, method, which means it's also the name of the, the view. Uh, okay, it looks like I can probably throw something like uh, ahref equals uh, slash businesses business.id. Okay, cool, and that's gonna get all of them. That is gonna get all of them. If I go back, I refresh this, now all of these become like specific links. And if I test them, hopefully it'll take me to the right place. Businesses five, cool. Windler group, architect leading edge inf. Ridiculous. Meteors. Did you build this ID? I did not build this. One thing to note, it already has a back button. It doesn't have, is that something that was generated? Sorry, yeah, the back button is this. Like yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I just, I just threw it. It's in the curriculum. I just copied and pasted it. Okay. Yeah. So in, it is um, on the actual page. The CSS is written to automatically. Uh, you know, like when you go back, it's it's purple. You know. Yeah. That's it's automatic. That's an automatic thing. It's like it's it's CSS for Chrome. Oh. So this user agent, this particular version, has recognizes that you've already clicked it yeah. and thus changes the color from blue into purple. You can kind of see here, <clears throat> all the ones that I've already clicked have turned from blue to purple and it'll remain that way unless I tell it not to. Does that last when you close out of this session and start a Chrome again? Nope. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, so we have the ability to read everything read individual ones, we can go back. Now we need to start working on uh, creating a new one. So I'm gonna create the same thing as yesterday, I'm gonna create that little link up here that says create a new business. I'm gonna create all in all the code that goes underneath it. First things first, we're gonna need a new route for get businesses new. And that's gonna go to businesses new. And like I was telling everyone just a little bit earlier, um, there is, I've put this inside of your curriculum. But essentially I've created a small table for you. Um, we, we are doing something called the REST API and it's basically a protocol to transfer data back and forth. Uh, it's not, I'm sorry. It's, a, you, you, using HTTP, which is the protocol to transfer data back and forth, there's a way that when I interact with Spotify, I expect it to work. Like, so I expect when I go to, when I go to like api.spotify.com and I go to slash artists, it's gonna give me all the artists. Like that is consistent across the board. The way that they create their URLs is gonna be consistent across the board. If I wanted the 50th artist in their database to be slash artists slash 50 or something like that. Um, I expect it in that in that manner. And similarly, when we take a look over here, this is a very simple example with just dogs. Um, like if I make a get request to slash dogs, and that's gonna list all the dogs, I expect the controller's uh, action name to be index. Or if I wa wanted to create a new dog or something like that, it'd be slash dog slash new, and the controller action would be new. So you wanna mimic this as closely as possible. Actually, no, you, you need to mimic this. So I need to create a new business. So I have get slash businesses slash new, and that's gonna take me to the businesses controller 
and it's going to be a new uh, method. So with that, I'm just going to do def new and at business equals business dot new. And because I'm coming here, this is the code that's being executed ahead of time, and then it's going to feed down into a view called new.html.erp. And I'm going to just grab this, this form in here. It's just copied directly over from yesterday's Sinatra stuff. It's just going to say create a new business, and this form is going to have the business name, address, and description, and a create business. So if I visit it in real life and I go to slash businesses slash new. Oh, it's no good. It says it couldn't find a business with ID new. There must be something wrong on this page. Or it might, might be something wrong over here. I told someone the answer to this yesterday. Why is it looking for an ID of new? Most businesses, symbol ID yep. above it. Yep, that's exactly it. Because it's, so computers are kind of, they're very, very fast, but they're also very, very stupid, uh, meaning that it does exactly what you tell it to do. Because this businesses slash ID came before slash new, it believes that oh, yeah, yeah. If this is a, the, the, I, this thing that comes after businesses is actually an ID, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's not the case. So I'm gonna move this up back refresh and here's that create a new business and it's all here's this nice little form for us um, I also kind of want a an href for I just want this a little link where it says like create a new business or something so I'm just gonna add that into the index page as well I'm just adding a HTML link that says go, that goes to slash business to slash new and it says create a new business. So you have to create a new What's that? New well, no. So when you go to new, it's just this is not doing anything yet. Like this okay, is just so the form. We haven't done the create oh, yet. Okay. So the, I, I need to get the I need to get the form up first. If I just type in anything, 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 and I hit create business blows up on the next screen, it says, there's no route that matches post businesses. Makes kind of sense because this is going to post businesses and I don't have a route for it quite yet. So same thing, it's like, this is like a very repetitive process. It's going to be post slash businesses. It's gonna to go to the business controller, businesses controller to create. What's so, the line you put into the, on the controller for the new, like yeah, I guess you're. I guess you're right. I don't technically need this, right? Because I'm not doing anything that requires a business in here. Yeah, I thought that that was what was giving the error. <laughs> oh no, yeah. you're you're probably right though. I probably don't need this at all. But the useful thing about that is that you're getting information, like you're you're utilizing the object that you. But I'm not using. Happens. But I'm not. I wasn't. That was the thing. So. I have at business here, and then I pass it into new, but there's I'm, there's nowhere that I'm calling the uh, instance variable, so I don't need it quite yet. But the care brings up a good point, which we will talk about probably tomorrow. Uh, the uh, I, We're gonna use the same layout for, for both things. I probably don't need this, and if I don't need that, I actually don't need the method at all. And I can refresh this business slash new, businesses slash new. So it'll still render. This, this is kind of the interesting thing. So when I go to businesses slash new, it takes me to business controller and the new action. Now, Alex brought up a point a little bit earlier. It's like, well, you're not using this variable at all inside of this, this file. So why do you have it there? And I said, that's a good point. I actually don't need this at all. And if you have a method with no um, with no action being taken inside of it, Rails automatically knows to skip over this layer 
and go directly into the view. So you don't need the, if you're not gonna do any sort of logic over here in the controller, you can just delete it all together, go straight into the view. All right, let's get to this next part. So we said post businesses will take me to businesses slash uh, create. So we'll go to def create and um, I'm gonna copy a bunch of stuff. All right, so I have this create thing. I have an instance variable called business.new with business params. If it saves, I'm gonna redirect them to that particular business is like the one that you just created. And if not, I'm gonna to redirect to the homepage and flash an error message that says you messed up, friend. Now, you may be wondering why am I passing in, why, why is this business params here and why is it underneath this crazy looking private thing? So as basically, as the web's gotten more advanced over the years, attacks have gotten more and more sophisticated. So technically, I don't need to fill out a form to hit this particular route. If I know how to, I, I can, if I allow, if I just pass in params like this, somebody could just say like, oh, my params is, uh, is gonna be like, a, it's gonna have like a malicious attack where it's like select star from credit cards or something like that, where limit is greater than $10,000. So that they can go on a shopping spree and they can pass this directly into your database and that, that might actually return something. So as a way to combat this, we want to, we created something called strong parameters, which means that I'm protecting your, I'm protecting my users by saying, I'm only allowing certain things to come through. I'm only expecting business name, address, and description. Only those things will be allowed to come into my database. I won't be able to pass in anything extra like malicious attack or something like that. Okay, so let's create a new business. We'll refresh this, we'll call it, uh, we'll, let's create a business together. The, the seven of us, worldwide. what's that? Prestige Worldwide. Prestige worldwide. We'll call this, uh, we'll put this in Beijing, China, because that's where Taylor is going. Give me a BS, ridiculous thing that your company tagline. Uh, <laughs> leveraging virability scopes to online yes. fitness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna create a business. So, no. oh, boo, uh, raise up. Oh, this is one thing I forgot. Um, it's a, it's a small little fix. I forgot to add this to the curriculum. All right, whatever, sorry. <laughs> create the business. So it doesn't create something that went wrong. Hmm. Can you explain how business params gets, like how does that take in the params? Where is it saved in this rock of genes? Where's create and save? Yeah. Okay. Sure, let's put a pry in here and then we will refresh this page. Create a new business. We'll call this Prestige Worldwide. We'll put in Beijing and we'll do what was, what was the first word you said? Just press down will it come up? No. ET, okay. Leverage. Nice. Create the business. So now I'm stuck. Oh, undefined method pry. Uh, okay. <laughs> add it to the add it to this here. Gem pry. I'm going to need to kill the server here and bundle install. Server so yep. All right, so we go to businesses slash new. Oh my gosh. 
Prestige Worldwide in Beijing and leveraging. Great businesses. All right, now we're stuck inside the price session. Let's take a look at what params looks like. So we have params, all of this kind of stuff. All right, let's take a look at what business params gives us. It says we get address description. Okay. Um, is, where's name? Did I not put that in there? Let's find out. Ah, oh, it's, yeah, I called it business name, my mistake. That's why it wasn't saving. So it said, uh, didn't take me to where I wanted to go. You have to remove the prime. I do not want to remove the prime because that's what Alex was wondering about. So I'm going to create this business. It's going to go back into this price session. I'm stuck here. So the params I get for free because that is when, when you submit a form, there is a hash that's globally called params that I get for free. And that's, this is that giant thing that we have there. So it's because it's in a controller, it's going to be action, action controller params. Um, but it's still a hash. You can still access it like a hash. And there's pieces of information inside of it called name, address, uh, description, and a whole bunch of extra stuff. Here's that kind of like extra stuff that we may not want to save inside the database completely. If you take a look at these business params right here, it's saying I'm only permitting certain things to come through. I'm only permitting the name, address, and description to come through. So if I, let me just highlight this and save it to A equals params.permit. So you can kind of see it's a smaller subset. I'm only taking the name, address, and the description. So this controller business and action create is gone. Like the, I, I don't need these things anymore. And on, on top of that, there's this little extra security check that says like permitted false. And then now it says permitted true. Didn't know you could pass, like it would be a variable to that function without having to pass it. Uh, it's it's available inside the entire controller at that point. It's it's one of those like given things. Okay, so it saves. It takes me to Prestige Worldwide in Beijing and our lovely little description. So this this view probably didn't have errors as a flash available to it. Otherwise, it would have. Yeah, it said you messed up, friend, or something like that. All right, so let's go, let's do that, that little flash message. So because you remember when we got redirected, it didn't tell us that anything had messed up. We just knew that it wasn't on the page. That's not very descriptive. We wanna make it as robust as possible. So inside of my index, html.erb, actually, let's just put it inside of layouts.html.erb. So remember we talked about this a little earlier this week, layout, it's the thing that's loaded up before everything else. Uh, so it's going to have something for like businesses and all the meta tags and all the style sheets and, and all this kind of stuff. And then inside the body, then it's going to yield over to like the individual views themselves. And so this is, this is Ruby shell right here. This is, it's not Ruby shell. It's, it's like the view shell. It's like, if you go to, if you go to amazon.com, the footer on the bottom of the page and the header at the yeah. top remain the same. Yeah. It's just the middle section changes over and over again. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, this is what when you when you open this in a Rails file, this this was already there. This was already there. Yeah. I'm gonna add this little bit right here. It's just a paragraph tag that says I'm gonna flash the success message unless this the flash is blank. I'm gonna flash an error unless the flash error is blank. So I'm gonna save this. Run this one more time. Let me get rid of. Oh, messed up, friend. There it is. Refresh it again. Get rid of this binding pry. Let me create a new business with no name and no address and just a description. It takes me back, to, it redirects me to the home page. It lets, lets me know, like, hey, you messed up, my friend. And then I'll refresh the page and then it goes away. Yeah. All right, let's take a seven minute break until 11.20. And we'll come back, we'll finish with update and delete.
Up to this point, we have done the first two letters of CRUD. We are able to create new businesses almost identically with like copy and paste code from like old school stuff from Sinatra. We're able to read all of them and read each individual one. And we have this little back button that I've created. Now we want to have the ability to update and delete um, these, these particular businesses. So let's take, um, let's take Prestige Worldwide. I, I really hope that you create a, like a brand of China called Prestige <laughs> Worldwide now. <laughs> All right, so let's take Prestige Worldwide and we want to change the description of this. So the first thing we're, need, we're going to need to do, one, always create a route for it. So I'm gonna have a route for get businesses. Somebody finish this off for me. What, what is this? I, what is, is this supposed to be? Edit like this? Yeah, ID. Oh, ID. ID. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, the other things. Are. Yep. So that's, it looks good. And this is going to go to the businesses controller to the edit page. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I need to, I know I need businesses controller, edit action. Jump over here. I'll just throw it anywhere on this page. Def edit. So first things first. I know that I'm going to need to find it from the database based off of this U, this uh, the ID that's found in the URL. Is it outside of the class now? Though? Pardon? Is it outside of the class? It is. This is outside of the class. No, the other. This is right now. It's not connected to the class. Oh, okay. Yet. So I'm going to have at business because I'm talking about a singular one. I'm going to do business dot find params ID. So I'm going to I'm going to now I'm connecting to the model which is gonna connect into the database. Once I find that particular one, I'm going to, I don't need that ERB like businesses edit anymore. I, I, it, this goes by default automatically into businesses looking for a template called edit HTML ERB. Edit.html.erb. Okay. And I am going to copy this over from yesterday. All of this is identical, okay? All of this is identical, I just changed a few things. So I have the H1 for edit business. I have a, a form, a form by default is going to be a post action, and it's going to post to um, slash businesses slash business ID. But right underneath that, I'm going. this is actually not a formal post because I'm not creating something new, I'm updating something that already exists. So I'm gonna change it to put. Uh, let's just see what this looks like when I go to slash this slash edit it says edit business and you can see I've, all, I've also interpolated everything up to this point so I don't have to type it in again and that's done through this value right here so like what's the value of the input I'm going to interpolate business dot name business dot address because nothing is worse so like I I like to pr pretend like I'm a globe trotter and I got global entry through credit cards and stuff like that but I remember when I was applying for global entry I filled out the entire form. It's like four pages long worth of stuff. I press submit. Guess what happened to all my stuff because I missed one thing. It all went away. <laughs> Completely <laughs> gone. I had to re-enter everything. Um, so when you are filling out forms and someone makes a mistake, just kind of like save all the progress that they have and then put inside the value on HTML so they don't have to type that in again. Uh, because it's, I mean, that's just kind of like government websites in general, right? It's just terrible. <laughs> All right, so you can see that I'm going to change something here. And I'm going to change this to uh, Taylor's baby, right? Like this prestige worldwide is Taylor's baby. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to, all right. I'm going to update this, and it's going to blow up. And it says there's no route that matches put businesses slash 11. So we're going to go again, routes, which means we probably need a put slash businesses slash ID to businesses update. So I have the route. It takes me to the controller, to this particular um, method. So I'll put it right underneath here. Same thing, I need to find it based off the ID that's passed in in the URL. As you can see here, I pass in the URL as well. Uh, I'm going to at business uh, dot update attributes 
with business params. Again, it's just like similar to creating. I don't want to be able to update things inside my uh, database. Anytime I touch my database, I need to make sure I'm only allowing the things to come through that are supposed to come through. So, but let's. Params is not. Params is just the idea at this point, right? Uh, parent. That's the method down there, right? I mean, no, he's saying. Really... He's saying does. Oh. Uh, he's saying since I'm visiting this particular site. I have params ID. We agree that that's cool, right? Yeah. Um, params, so all the stuff that's in the form actually also gets added into params. I'll show you. Put it on your program. And I'm going to actually add a few more things. Uh, if it updates, then I will redirect to slash businesses. I'll copy this line. Else, uh, redirect to Maybe I'll have a uh, flash message. Sorry. Okay. So let's go back to businesses slash 11 slash edit. Everything is the same as before. We're going to name this Taylor's baby. And update this and I'm stuck in a prize session. I'm not going any further. So let's take a look at what params looks like. So yes, I do have, like I said, we do have the ability to re read the params from the URL, which is right here. But we also have the ability to see everything that was put in inside of the, um, inside the form. So if I exit here, it's going to hit this because it's going to be able to update successfully. And it says your business was updated successfully and that it'll redirect me to that page. So exit your business was updated successfully. Let's go back and let's make this not work. So I know that I need a name and address. That's a validation we had right off the beginning. Let's just say Taylor has been kicked out of the country, has no idea where he's going to go next update here. Exit. It says edit not saved friend because you can't have a blank address. So that's what I have here with this. If business update attributes, like if it actually updates successfully, it does not blow up, then do this. Otherwise flash an error that says it wasn't saved and redirected back to that save page, the edit page. How, the param get a component actually... How does the params get the. Because when you, you have the action and the component. Mm -hmm. So params. How does it have this controller here in this action? Um, so again, it's one of those things where Rails gives you a lot of stuff for free. So like if like they just kind of give you like additional information in case you would ever need to use it for any purpose. So if you don't need to use it, you can just ignore it. This comes in for free because it's actually an action controller parameters object. And when they keep the action update, mm -hmm. why, is it, I mean, why is update action? Is it in a um, Which line are you talking, is it this thing? No, yeah, the action update. I'm just curious, right? The action uh, update? Mm -hmm. So action is action is the method that's being called and it's because we are st we are here inside the businesses controller So that's the controller business and the action is the method and that's the update. We're, we're right here inside here cool. All right last little bit let's Let's finish out with the delete functionality and remove this So again step one always create a route so destroy slash businesses slash ID. 
and that's going to take me to businesses destroy. So I'm going to, it's going to take me to the business controller, the destroy method. I'm just going to do that here. So def destroy. I pass in the parameters of the ID so I can find it again. And I'm just going to do at business dot destroy. And then I'm going to flash an error that's uh, flash a message. It says your business was deleted successfully and redirect to slash businesses. And on top of that, I'm going to, I'm going to have two extra links here. One is going to be for It's going to be slash businesses slash All right, so I'm going to create um, a few. I'm going to create a few extra links on the show page. So let's go back to like businesses slash 11, back to Taylor's business. Um, it is undefined method destroy for business. Did I misspell? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's here. You're correct. Sorry. Thank you. So I created two extra things. I created this extra horizontal line just to split up edit and edit back and edit this, this thing. So if I click this, it'll take me to slash edit. If I press this delete right here, um, it's going to be a small little form that we had from yesterday. If I can ever find it where it's because a form by default is going to be a post. I'm go actually going to change the method to delete. And then from there, it'll hit my, it'll hit my routes. Go to delete slash ID, which will take me to the businesses controller destroy. It's going to find the, the, the thing in the database, delete it, and then redirect me to slash businesses. Let's see if this works. Your business was deleted successfully and Taylor's dream is dead. So Taylor's baby. Taylor's babies. No, no, that's no. <laughs> that's, 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 All right. So there are that this is like a basic like transfer over from like Sinatra into Rails. It's going to take like a day or so just to kind of get used to the Rails way, just kind of the way that it took about a day to get used to the uh, Sinatra way. Um, there is a few pieces of code that are repeated that I'm not really going to go into like how to refactor quite yet. But you can kind of see I have business find params like four times on this page. So I can probably make that into a helper method that would probably go somewhere. Um, yeah, so this is this is a basic overview of this. How does this feel? Does it feel okay? Or is it just really confusing? I think it's better than the yeah. to do it. Okay, let's do this. Pause and stop the recording here.